In this episode of the Backend Engineering Show, I would like to talk about threading, multi-threaded application, specifically within the context of networking and connection management. To be more specific even than that, TCP connection management. It's very critical in backend applications that you have a, a socket that you listen to, whether this is a web server, whether this is an SSH server, whether this is a custom made protocol that you built, gRPC, you know, any other protocol, right? But the, the, the challenge becomes, how do you accept connections from clients and how much uh, can a single box, right, uh, manage all these connections from all these clients? This is what I want to talk about in this episode. Let's jump into it. Welcome to the Back in Engineering Show with your host, Hussein Nasser. And this is our series, our laid back series, where we sit down and, and discuss uh, interesting topics and in specifically to back in engineering. Uh, it's, a, it's a podcast, so you can listen to it on your favorite podcast player. There's, I usually don't add any graphic at all it's supposed to be just a talking head video so if you like this kind of content consider subscribing to this channel and check us out on the spotify and apple Podcasts. yeah i do have other content on this channel if you this is not your cup of tea of course i understand i have uh, all sorts of other content i have crash courses i have uh, you know tutorials i have uh, hands-on stuff using software you know with that out of the way let's get into it in the early days very 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 early days of computing when you spin up a process and you had a single cpu on your host machine and that process executes certain task let's say it accepts a connection and that connection now has some sort of a request let's say it's an http request once it uh, determines where the request starts and where the request ends, that logic of the translation of a request will be taken to the application, and then application stop processing it. Whatever that means, you know, if it's a git slash API, that will make a request to some other database that is in somewhere else. So we'll establish another connection to other database and the request since the SQL command or the, you know, key value request to get a value. Regardless what it is, the processing, some of the processing will be localized within that instance. So it will consume CPU power from that host. Some of the kind of the request will be not CPU bound, maybe IO bound, whether this is... Uh, uh, a network call or a desk call. Hey, I'm going to the desk. So that's why it's very important to understand the nature of your backend and whether it's, does it cost CPU or does it cost IO? And this is an episode by itself, you know, because you can scale differently based on that. But regardless, if you assume it's a CPU intensive app where you're, you're doing processing in the machine itself, right even after sending a request to the database getting response you kind of doing a localized processing even if you don't know it you're using you're probably using a library that does that kind of processing especially the serialization deserialization that's costly encryption decryption of tls all of this stuff is happening without us knowing and uh i try as much as possible at least this is for myself, to erase all this uh, am ambiguity and, and, you know, the vagueness of anything that I use by understanding what every single thing I use, what is actually doing, right? It's not everyone's cup of tea, I understand, but I like to understand everything I use. That's just me. You know, it just gives you... It keeps your eye open. In the old days, when you have this single core and you have single process, that core will be occupied to your process, 
right? And you might, your host might have multiple processes and they are sharing, you know, time sharing this CPU. I'm like, oh, let's stop that. I'm done. Uh, take over CPU, right? Take over the next process, process three, you, you can take over. And the operating system is scheduling these things, you know? Move few years move few more years a decade maybe in the future and now we were able to make cpus more powerful you know uh, we have more powerful cpus the single core is powerful move a little bit forward and now we have the ability to add multiple cores in a processor so you have a processor but that processor will have multiple cores. So there's dual cores. Technically, think of uh, two CPUs, you know? And we have four cores, eight cores, so on. With that in mind, we don't have contention between different applications now. Right? Because if I if I my single process app will get a core and the other host processes can use other cores that's pretty neat i no longer share one core between all the processing but developers thought about it and says aha that sounds like a great idea what if my app i'm greedy i am greedy my app is a single process but what if my app actually consists of multiple processes or multiple threads right a process and a thread is very it's, like, it's almost like a splitting hairs when it comes to like process and a thread especially in linux i think a process is a thread it's just like they share the same memory sort of speak right so what people invented was says like, all right let's just spin up multiple threads you yeah? so multiple worker threads and we have one main thread and let them do the work in parallel why because now not only i have access to one core my multiple threads can utilize multiple cores you know at the same time and that was so even i'm sorry to remember even in the 2006 ish 2006 and 2007 multi-threading was the jam you know like everybody was talking about multi-threading it's like oh yeah you have to get into multi-threading like maybe it was earlier than that but when i because 2005 was the start of my career and this is where i started hearing about multi-threading and it's just being a lot of people start talking about it so now a lot of people move to multi-threading because of the performance benefit they might they might get right because now I can share multiple CPU. If a single process needs X amount of CPU and I can parallelize that work, let's spin up multiple threads, right? And let divide this work and let them all spin up uh, uh, their own task and they execute these tasks in parallel concurrently, if you will. That was a revelation. So now we are using multiple cores. So it, the app is, is faster. But just like any human evolution, nothing comes without its own problems. Almost every solution we create as engineers comes with its own downsides. I can't think of anything that we created you know, software engineering-wise, that didn't come with its own downside. It's always, always the case. Correct me if I'm wrong. What's the problem with multi-threading? Well, the benefits of multi-threading is obvious. The problems with multi-threading is two things that I can think of. First, the management of the threads and the resource access. We mentioned that when you spin up a process, you are allocated certain amount of memory, right? It's called the heap. You can dump your stuff there. But then 
and and we never had this problem before with a single process because a single process is a single process you know it's when a single process want to write a read a variable it can go ahead and read that variable when it want to write that variable nobody's writing to that variable except itself but with multi-threading all these threads shares the same memory it's a shared memory when it comes to just that process you can also have shared memory between processes as well i suppose no i'm pretty sure you can <laughs> i think postgres has that concept and uh, it's an operating system thing i think you can have a dedicated shared memory but the moment you have a shared memory between these threads those guys start competing on these resources because no two thing no two threads can access the same variable at the same time you might say why they can't sure they can let them do that but you get undesired results mm -hmm. this is a whole thing i talk about in my database course when it comes to the acid thing like uh, atomicity consistency isolation and durability we have the same problem there right because we are a concurrent system database after all so you have two transactions trying to update the same row. What does what does that mean? What is what do we do? So the simplest thing to do is to acquire a mutex or a lock. I think it's the same thing. No, where you if a thread wants to write something, it acquires a mutex on it. It locks it. it says hey, hey, this variable I'm about to write to it. Nobody can write to it or nobody can read to it at all. So if another thread want to do something to that, it's blocked. So you, man, the management of this stuff is absolutely challenging. A lot of people liked it in the beginning, but the more they got into it, the more complex your app becomes. Now, things that you used to not worry about, now you have to worry about them at the cost of an additional CPU. So you're finding yourself serializing things. So, so you, the multi-threaded apps. All of a sudden, now if this uh, if these threads are completely isolated, you you want the jackpot. But if they need to access the same variable, which guess what? Almost most of the time, you're gonna need to access the same variable either to read or to write, to increment the value. Even increment is a very hard problem to solve. It's like how do you increment something? You have to serialize it. And when I say serialize, I mean you have to lock it so that the other thread cannot, they cannot br both of the time. Let's take an example. Let's say increment the value, the variable foo, right? If you have two threads that does the increment, both of them will read the value, both of them will read zero, both of them will increment it, and then both of them will store one. That's not correct right because incrementing in that particular case should give you zero one and two instead you got one so that's just a simple example of where things can go wrong yeah but so now we talked about multi pro multi-threading uh of one of the problems with multi threads, the management of the threads. the second problem that i think of is uh isolation in in a bad way if every thread is running in isolation, we don't know what the workload of these threads. We don't know if this thread is overloaded compared to this thread that is might not be overloaded. So as a result, you might not have even load balancing between these threads, right? So in order to do that, you have to introduce a manager, a coordinator, more complexity but it is it is what it is so why am i talking about multi-threading right we all know what multi-threading is but it, i thought it's very critical to talk about it. and then we're gonna link it back to socket management and connection management here you see when you have when you have a web application and no js application and no js is a bad example it's a single thread so let's take it out of the equation. Let's say you built your own app from using C or Go. Yeah? And you have a single thread. And you said, hey, I want to listen on port 80. That's a web app, HTTP. Yeah? 
So would you listen on port 80? What happened is you're telling the operating system that, hey, on this particular IP address, I'm listening to port 80. And you can specify which IP address. You might say, what, do you, what does that mean? I should have only one IP address. Nope. You have so many IP addresses on your machine. You have the loopback. That's an IP address. You have, you might have an Ethernet. That has an IP address. Might have a Wi-Fi. That has an IP address. Might have a, a Docker bridged in, uh, interface NIC. You might have a virtual NIC. You might have another Ethernet port. Yeah? And all, all of these network card, another NIC, I mean, can have their own IP address. They have their own connected to their own gateway and they have another completely different IP and a different subnet. So when you listen in a specific interface, right, you can listen on all of them if you want. And sadly, that's the default in most. Uh, I didn't understand this before. Uh, I recently learned it like in the past year. Like listening is very expensive. And I, 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 I really... I'm really worried that the default, when you don't specify, hey, listen, 80, even in Node.js, most apps, when you listen, it's listening on all interfaces. Why? I would love, I guess they did it for simplicity, but just like anything in engineering, the, mo the, if you, the moment you simplify the developer experience by making the code easier, you're introducing, you're hiding abstractions, right? You're introducing abstraction, which hides the complexity of these interfaces, right? And this is a perfect example. When you just listen on port 80, I know I'm going to go all the, over the place, but I think it's all related. So if you listen on port 80, which is the default, like without and with specifying a host, what will happen is, it will listen to an IP, a pseudo IP address called 0.0.0.0, .0, .0, .0, .0 right? which means listen on all interfaces. And to nitpick, actually, I think it listens to all IPv4 interfaces, right? If you do FFFF, FFFF, that, that listens to uh, all IPv6. I might be wrong on that one, but just... Just a guess, right? So this is all, all interfaces. Why? What What if you're building like an admin API, right? And this admin API should only be accessed within the machine itself or within a specific interface. So if that host happened to have a public IP address and you wrote your application in a way that such that it listens to all IP address by default, then it, you just expose your admin API to the public. That's why, <laughs> that's why all, all, all these leaks happen with Elasticsearch leak and MongoDB leak and, and, and Postgres leak, right? Because when you listen, when Postgres listens to us, when MongoDB listens, it listens to all IP addresses. I think the default should be changed. The default should be, hey, you tell me which interface to listen to. And I understand it's not, it's not convenient for programming, but I think we should, at some point we should stop simplifying everything because that's not the way to go, right? Just simplifying everything because eventually you're going to get, get bit in the ass. That's what is going to happen right yeah you simplify the api and that's true for everything we do in software engineering look at all the countless libraries all competing to make the code shorter and instead of writing oh my code is only five lines of code oh my code is three line of code my code is one line of code in one line of code you can do all of this stuff these things really scares me because you 
the, the you know the developer who's going to use this you have no clue what's going on behind that one line of code you know and that is really creepy right hey if you know what's going on all power to you but if you don't and you're just using an app and there's just hey one line of code and voila i built twitter that's a whole thing by itself i don't know yeah i know i know <laughs> we'll, we'll come back to the point yeah so listening on port we talked about all these ipv4 thing ip interfaces but we listened we have a listener and it's a single thread listener yeah. so when you listen what happened is the operating system will allocate look at the backlog for you a queue if you will yeah. again this is just tcp let's not go through udp right now because http1 and http2 is tcp so let's just, just assume tcp for now if you listen the operating system will echo, will allocate a queue for you and you can specify the length of this queue i think it's thousand by default and that queue is in the kernel memory so you're here at the user space you listen to your application is running you ask the operating system hey i'm listening to port 80 the os will create all right it says okay i'm listening on the loop back 1277001 right let's say i'm i'm um, i'm practicing hygiene here and i only listen to the loop back because i don't really need to listen to anything else so the os will create this two queues for us something called the send queue and something called the accept queue right what are these well we talked about how the tcp works right there is a sen senac and then ac which is the three-way handshake so every time a client want to connect to your server on that specific ip address on that specific port which is 80 it will need to send a sen packet tcp segment which is carried in an IP packet and is sent to that. The operating system receives it through the network interface controller, right? Or some people like to call it card, network interface card. Same thing, right? That network card will take that frame and then package it up into an IP packet and then package it up into a TCP segment and then ship it to the to the operating system and I think it doesn't even do that it just takes the frame hey is it is it destined to is the frame destined to this machine yes yep just take it ship it to the OS the OS will take it oh it's a sin and it's destined to 80 and it's destined to this IP address yep that's me let me add this to the sin queue and it will add it to the sin queue right the app doesn't know about it yet all right the moment it adds that to the send queue the os kicks in and it will say all right let, it's time to start finishing the handshake right so once it added to the sin queue the os will kick in and they say okay let me take this sin request because someone has tried to connect to me right at this point it's not a full-fledged connection yet it's just a request to connect if you will so the os will take that sin they say okay sin i need to send a synac i agree synac will send a synac to the to the uh to the client and then we'll move on because it needs to receive the final act right so we'll move on so meanwhile lots of other sins are coming connection to request and they are added to the queue yeah and that's by the way how sin flooding can happen right because because you're adding blindly adding the sin packets to this queue this queue can easily get flooded right why very easy a client that sends a sin and never acts okay? just send 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 all of a sudden you're flooded nobody can else can connect why because there is a timer and the reason is every sin that is received all right is it automatically synact immediately it will be 
try to send act the, the operating system will try to rescind us and act back and that will immediately fill back the backlog that we talked about so you can increase the backlog but you can decrease the backlog to prevent that send flooding has been solved uh, with send cookies but we don't want to go that right now it's a different story for another day but that's how it works so let's say a legitimate client will send an act back so completing effectively the handshake so when the operating system receives that final act it maps it back to an entry in the queue it says oh oh you are from this guy because the sin will have a source port and a source ip and a destination port and a destination ip and those four tuples will be mapped to that queue effectively right and that will effectively complete the connection and the moment the connection is complete that pop it's popped from the queue and now there is another queue that we talked about the accept queue which is basically a full-fledged connection happen here so hey i i guarantee this client is good he finished the connection with us again we didn't send anything here we're just connecting we didn't even establish the tls i'm not even ha talking about tls right here right it's, it's port 80 right uh, the next thing is to send an actual http request right but we send that and now that connection will be transferred to an accept queue all right what does that mean it means that it's the operating system did its job it's up to the application which is moi remember i listened listening to an app doesn't mean you have connections right you as the application which is the backend application in this particular case have to accept connections actively accept connections so you have to technically ask the you the operating system do i have a connection do you have a connection do i have a connection do i have a connection do i have a connection that's how it works today right and you can do this by calling something called accept. And you might say, I never did this with Node.js. Well, Node.js does that for you behind the scenes. Yeah? There, is, there is an infinite loop that just accepts. Yeah? What is this infinite loop, you might say? It is in your thread. Which is, again, we said it's a single thread app. So we have one listener. It, 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 it has a loop. That, and that's accepting all the connection. And the way it works, if it calls accept, if the the the, the function call accept will go to the operating system, say, hey, I want to accept the connection. So sure, you, you have one right here in the accept queue. Take it. And take it really means that it was going to be popped from the accept queue and a file descriptor, a unique integer value, will be returned to that thread that it called accept. Whoever called it will get that file descriptor. And that file descriptor will present your connection. And that is one client, one connection, one user connected to you. And then you can exchange information using that file descriptor. So the thread can write to the file descriptor and it can read from the file descriptor. And that's its own story. Right? Reading and writing there is asynchronous read, there is synchronous blocking read, and there is this whole new thing that Linux built called I.O. Uring, which is a fabulous design for asynchronous reads and writes for everything, files, network calls, pretty much everything, right? So I.O. Uring, that's what it's called. But let's, let's not get into a lot of details here. Let's keep this objective and yeah sure what's the problem i have a single thread that single thread which is node.js contrary to the belief and uh, node.js is a single threaded app yeah it has multiple threading app but has nothing to do with networking right the networking is still a single threaded experience in node.js the only time node.js uses a multi-threading and it's documented well documented in node.js is when it does dns entries and in specific libraries where it uses multi-threading but dns definitely right 
And I suppose when, when it uses asynchronous file system reads, I talked about th Node.js threading, uh, check out the video there. Just type Node.js threading Hussein, and uh, you, you should find it. But yeah, uh, but network, all single thread. So that means I have a loop that accepts connection, and I have a loop that actually processes my request. Hmm. So that's actually pretty cool. So that connection, that thread will just accept the connections. So I have a connection file descriptor. What if, what if another user came in? Another connection request. Well, I'm just going to accept it again. The thread, if it's free, it's going to accept the connection. And now I have another file descriptor. So now it's your responsibility to add it into an array, so to speak, right? Because if, if it's an HTTP request, you, ha you, you can do that, right? You, there will be an event that will be called for you. And they say, hey, there is an, an event, an open, I think connection open is called, right? In HTTP library itself. And that will be delivering you a, an actual connection object, even fancier than that, right? And the connection object will have methods like write and read, and this is how WebSockets work identically, right? The same thing. And uh, you'll build basically a, an array of connection in your thread, in your process, and uh, you can talk to any one of them, right? And every connection object will have an event associated with it. So, and what is happening is your app is constantly asking, hey, did I, did I get a read here? Did I get a read here? Did I get a read here? Did I get a write here? All of this stuff is really gonna be managed by the Node.js HTTP library and says, okay, oh, some something just came in from connection number one. Oh, something just came in from, just came in from connection number 103 and so on, right? So we have one thread. What's the problem of this? It easily becomes the bottleneck, right? Because if one of those connections sent you an HTTP request, and at that HTTP request, you're doing a blocking call that is computing a hash or doing something so expensive. And let's assume you don't have threading because if you do like a specific crypto operation, Node.js will use threading if you enabled it. But let's assume there is none, right? So if you're doing that compute, that expensive, let's say it's a loop, while loop, I don't know, while loop one, true. Uh, you're done, basically. Why? Because now, it depends on what Node.js will do. I keep talking about Node.js as an example because it's a very popular backend, right? But if you build your own C application, you have to do all this stuff yourself, right? So now you're blocked and that becomes quickly becomes the bottleneck. Yeah? The listener thread cannot do work, technically. You, you can, of course you can, if you know the limit. But at the moment you do work in the listener thread, in the same thread, then new connections cannot be accepted or they will be delayed because the moment the listener thread, the worker thread, will have a time to breathe. <gasps> Finally, I'm done with this task. Oh, I'm go I'll go now go accept a connection. Oh, I'll go execute a read right here. Oh, let me go. Uh, the user asked me to write something. Oh. So it's just busy doing stuff. You will be facing blocking at some point, right? So now what do we do? Like one use case, right? Is uh, what Memcached does. And we just did a crash course architecture crash course on memcached what memcached does is it's exactly identical the same thing right it has one listener thread but that listener thread only accepts connection the moment it accepts a connection it spins up a new thread and since that thread that thread that connection file descriptor says hey thread take it that's yours now i'm gonna move on now you have the file descriptor you do a thing if there is a read that comes into that connection, it's your responsibility. If you want to write, write to that. I'm not involved anymore. As a main listener thread, my job has done. I just accepted the connection, I handed you the connection. The, so the connection array, if you will, is not in the listener main thread, it's in the somewhere else. Keep shaking the table. Right? It's, in, it's in the thread. 
So another connection came, spin up another thread. Another connection, spin up another. And there is a limit to the threads. I don't know what is the limit. I think it's a thousand, right? Because it will go crazy after a while, right? That's why Memcached say, hey, don't go above a thousand. <laughs> For instance, because yeah, I don't know what will happen. Right? It's fascinating. Once you know what's happening, it's just so cool to understand, really. Hey guys, Hussein from Post uh, editing right now and uh, noticed that uh, it might be, this is slightly incorrect reading through the memcache D. So I just wanted to clarify something. It sounds like the default number of threads in memcache D is four. You can up that, but they do not recommend that, right? But every connection that comes in, right, will spin up a new thread but up until the maximum number of thread allowed. So if you the default is four, those four will share these new connections. So every connection that comes in will be given to one of the available threads. So it's not one thread per connection, it's one thread multiple connections per thread. Otherwise, per, as per the doc, I'm gonna share it below as well. Uh, it's gonna be a disaster if there there will be like a thousand connection and a thousand thread. So one thread, multiple connection per thread. Just a slight clarification there. So just to be uh, objective a little bit here. Back to the video. Yeah, so that's one way. So the work, the compute is done in the threads, right? That's that's my point with the multi-threading. So that's powerful. So now I accepted the connection with the multi-thread right or with the listener thread but the connections are being worked out in each and all thread so a read that is happening is a responsibility of the thread that conti should continue to pull for reads are you is there a read is there a read is there a read is there a read right or a blocking read or a iou ring read depends what we whatever you use the threads are doing this job now so that's a model that's one way to do it What's a, so we talked about one way, have one thread do, do everything, ex, accept the connection and do the work. Doesn't scale well, right? Another way, memcached, have one thread, accept all the connection, but send off these connections, spin up a new thread for each connection and let the connection do the thread. What's the problem with that design? The problem with that design is... Uh, one connection, not all connections are equal. What does that mean? A client that connected to my application might be greedier than other clients, right? One, request, one client might send very heavy requests and another client might send lightweight request, right? Another client might just, just flood with me with requests that are so tiny. So they are not equal. What does that mean? It means that you'll end up with a thread that is so overloaded and other threads that has connections, have connections, but they're relaxed. They're just chilling, sitting there chilling, doing nothing or doing very minimum work. So you wasted memory on spinning all these threads, but those threads ain't doing much. Right? Why? Why is this the case? Because that's part of the problem on multi-threading we talked about initially, right? Multi-threading is just, there is no knowledge. Knowledge. Toilet paper. There is no knowledge. Doesn't exist. The knowledge doesn't exist between these threads. So you'll end up with unfairness. And this world that we live in is very unfair, my friends. It's very, very unfair. So one thread might do 80% of the work while the other uh, threads are sitting by the water cooler and drinking and chatting and uh, just uh, having fun, you know? So another model is as follows. What if we do this? What if let the... So that's the third one now. Let, let there be one listener thread let that be multi-threading, but here's how we're going to do it. That thread is responsible to accept the connection, so we have the connections, but keep the connection arrays in the main thread. Mm, isn't that just the first one? No, 
Wait a second. Let's do that. Let's do that. What if, since, since we're trying to solve this load balancing problem, right? What if we do this? What if we accepted the connections, we have this connection array in the thread, all the file descriptors, but we also read from all the connections, but we do not process. So we read the request. So the main lesson of the thread is just re accepting connections, saving these file descriptors, and also reading from all these connections. So it's reading request. But the read request. Oh, you want git slash. This is git slash API. Oh, this is git slash blah. This is git slash. Blah. And now that it has the vision of requests, what it does is hey, okay, I have a request. I think this is gonna be expensive. Go there, thread. Hey, there's another request. Go there. Hey, there's another thing. All right. And it's we start distributing requests to threads, not connections. The, the threads have no clue about connections here. So you just send requests. Boop, 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 boop. Send requests. Hey, process this, process this, process this. So now we just split the problem. That is a beautiful design. I like it a lot. Yeah? I like it a lot. Now we kind of distributed the law because now if there is a thread that is doing a lot of work, the main thread knows about it. Hey, this thread is busy. It knows it's busy because, hey, it's talking to it. You can argue that this is part of the problem. We're talking to it. There is an exchange. But hey, you got to pay a price, all right? That thing is free. But yeah, just talking to it. Talk, 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 talk to it. And then send requests. Right? And hey, you're busy. Hey, here's, here's a thread that is not doing anything. Hey, get back to work. Here's some work. Do some work. Stop sitting next to the water cooler do some work okay no more sitting next to the water cooler okay so load balancing is solved that's 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 an interesting solution that's all i like it a lot i like it a lot i forgot what app uses that design though here's another one um uh, go back to the original model right no, let's 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 do one more. So one, two, three, fourth. A fourth one. We always talk about one listener thread. Why don't we have only one listener process? Why don't we have multiple processes listen to the same port? Ha ha! We can't. Have you even seen this error before? You listen to port eighty and you try to listen to port eighty again on another app. It says hey, port is already listening. Ah la la, can't do that. Right? That was by design. You cannot have two processes listen on the same port. But if you know what you're doing, you can turn that, that switch and let the operating system know, mm, it's cool operating system. I own these two puppies. So you can spin up two puppies, two threads, listening on the same port by turning on an option called so reuse port socket option underscore reuse port it's like hey reuse port reuse port so now you have multiple threads listeners listening on the same port so now multiple threads you can have 10 threads listening on the same port so the operating system and all of them are calling accept are looping and calling accept. So now with the throughput of accepting connection are way higher. You don't have a single thread accepting the connection because if you have a client, a flood of users connecting at the same time, you're going to face trouble accepting connections, right? We talked about that, right? The accept queue might be full and the app is not fast enough accepting these connections because it's just a single thread. So you do this, just, just scatter shot. All of the threads, threads are listener thread. All of them are listening. All of them are listening at the same time. And all of them are accepting connections. So it's an in parallel connection acceptance. So each of you, whatever connection you accept, it's your loot. You take care of it. It's yours. You process it. You do whatever you want. Proxies like Envoy support that. Proxies like HA proxy supports that, I suppose. Nginx even supports that. Right? 
because it's a it's a busy you do this when you have like a very busy backend you accept a, like an api gateway a load balancer like a layer four reverse proxy when you do that even layer seven doesn't matter right you right this gateway is gonna have ton of connections so you would need to accept as fast as possible connections either deliver them to another thread you can do that model right instead of you but then you're gonna have a thread explosion right so comes to the fourth this is fourth one fifth one now which is kind of i i like back to the basics back to the original model single beautiful thread it listens and it works might as I say, you're not using your power of multi-core. Sure, I can though. What if I I don't want to listen to the same port? Single threaded app, so simple. That's my job. That's my app. So my app becomes so elegant because it's a single threaded. It doesn't have this mumbo jumbo of threads and connections and loop and coordination. None of that. A single thread, you might say, Hussein, it's a single core. You're not going to take advantage of your uh, 16 core AWS instance here. I'll let you know. I have this beautiful thing, and I use this thing that's called Docker. You know? Put in my app in a container, and I spin up 100 containers of my application. All of them are different ports, sure. And then put that, and then let them do the work, right? In this case, can I have two containers listening on the same port? I wish I can. Like, if it's not, po if it's possible, then this is really good. Let the operating system handle that. I suppose you can. I never tried it, right? But that would be really cool. But even if not, then I can just do an IP table rule that just say, hey, if someone connects to port four four three or eighty load balance them through these guys right and you're gonna have an a, a process running on port 81 82 83 just give an example so now your app is didn't change but now you just taken advantage of a single threaded app but literally multiplicated right so you are taking advantage of your single machine cores and at the same time, you kept your application simple. I like this design. I like it a lot. So, hey, you might say uh, one one app might receive more load than the other. Then you might add another logic on top of it, like a, a layer four proxy that controls that. Maybe well, you can do that. Then, of course, it becomes kind of a single point of failure. Make it simple. Make it a NAT level layer four proxy. I don't know. I just I just like that fifth model. It's just it seems like it's so elegant and simple. I, I of course nothing is free. I, I'm pretty sure it has its own problem. But simplicity, like going back to the basics. Okay. My app having my app being simple is is a game changer. That given that you have to of course write your app in a way that is statelessly way. Yeah, in a certain isn't it? I throw an Arabic word there. It, when I'm tired specifically after, after a long day like today right i'll uh, my english juice will deplete and i'll start throwing arabic words because back to my native language it, i i work all of it and by the time i 6 p.m i'll start just uh i can't talk english anymore i don't this is just me <laughs> <laughs> all right this is kind of an indication that i have to end this video all right guys hope you enjoyed this uh, video I, I like this stuff i like this a lot uh, i'm learning a lot and uh if you enjoy this kind of content consider becoming a member of this channel supports the show uh check us out on spotify apple podcast would you if you prefer to listen to this and uh check out my courses uh this is this is kind of at the same realm, network.husseinnasr.com for a discount coupon. Learn the fundamentals of network engineering because any anything that comes on top can be derived to its basic first principles. Hope you enjoyed this episode. I'm going to see you on the next one. You guys stay awesome. Goodbye.